States, strongly allied with Mediterranean and other free nations, guards the Mediterranean Sea, a long-range program of economic aid and mutual defense results in an adequate local strength to discourage all aggressors. The instrument chosen to provide military power is the United States Sixth Fleet. At the Norfolk, Virginia Naval Base, ships which will relieve those now on duty with the Sixth Fleet prepare to depart for the Mediterranean. Thousands of items are taken aboard. Planes ply a good-sized airfield. Spare engines and parts for those planes to keep them in first-class operating condition. All the different kinds of ammunition needed and food enough to feed thousands of men in the American tradition. To the men who man the ships, the fleet's overall objective may become obscured by the sweat and toil of preparing for sea. To each man, six fleet duty is a job to be done, sprinkled with some personal sorrow and a few bits and pieces of pleasure. Like native sons of all nations, they love their homeland. They don't look forward to being away for six months or more. Greatly diminished is the personal desire for participation in the struggle which helped take the sting out of wartime departures. In its place is a certain dogged determination to do a good job and pride in the highest degree of technical skill in the history of the Navy. arrives. There's a lump in your throat that won't go away as you try to pack six months of goodbyes into a few awkward minutes on a dock. There's a deep sadness that won't disappear until he returns. Who can foretell what may happen before they're together again? All the ages of man are represented. They've seen Dad leave them seven times in the last five years, and he hasn't been home for Christmas in three years. are removed, the last physical ties between the ships and the nation they represent cease to exist. Tugs move the big flat top into the channel. Landmarks such as Old Point Comfort and Fortress Monroe fall astern on the port side. In these waters, naval history was made almost a hundred years ago when the Monitor and the Merrimack fought the world's first battle between ironclad ships. This is the captain speaking. As you all know, the intensive training and preparations which we have been undergoing the past few months have been pointed towards our next tour of duty in the Sixth Fleet. In case you're asking yourself just how important it is, let me 
call on some past history to help you assess the importance of a strong force for peace in the Mediterranean. Two world conflicts in less than 30 years found this country unprepared to defend itself or help our friends. Today, we on this ship are a symbol of America's new belief that in strength is a means to prevent war. Our part is to make the next six months of our military life in peacetime count strongly towards helping prevent years of war and millions of casualties. We can be proud of this power we possess because no peace-loving nation has any cause to fear us. The willingness and the cooperation you have all shown makes me know that our ship, the Randolph, will be a good ship, a happy ship, and the pride of the Sixth Fleet. Carry on. Heading eastward across the Atlantic, the Sixth Fleet relief element makes good speed toward its new duty station. Twelve days later, the carrier Randolph and two escorting destroyers approached Gibraltar, gateway to the Mediterranean. Jets from the USS Forrestal, someplace in the Mediterranean, welcome their relief ship back to its old cruising ground. Friendly porpoises make up another welcoming committee. 3,000 miles from home, the British Crown Colony of Gibraltar. A 21-gun national salute for Gibraltar. Area anchored, the destroyers proceed into port. Outside the harbor, other newly arrived destroyers steam by on their way to relieve their counterparts operating in the Mediterranean. In the afternoon, the huge gray shape of the supercarrier Forrestal arrives in company with two destroyers ready to be relieved after six months' duty in the Met. The following morning, destroyers arrive from another area of the Mediterranean. They too will soon be relieved and returned to the States. Formal calls on dignitaries ashore are one of the more important duties of flag officers in many ports. Hands across the sea in the interests of mutual defense of a vital area affecting the welfare of 200 million people and world peace. Now, at once, make your latest reports for getting on the way to the officer's deck on the bridge. Transfers of equipment, men, and information have been completed. The relief element has the duty and is ready to put to sea, on its way to join other fleet units for the very vital purpose of training. Randolph is underway. Sunset finds the ships on an easterly course in a peaceful sea. Life aboard ship settles down to a normal underway routine. Everyone has a job to do and a time to do it. Just like back home, some people work while others sleep or relax. In the wardroom, tomorrow's flight schedule is delivered. Flight quarters, 0515. Get some sack time while you can. 
For those with the midnight to 4 a.m. watch coming up, it's easier to stay awake when you turn in. Taps, taps, lights on. All hands turn into your bunks. Maintain silence about the decks. The smoking lamp is out in all birthing spaces. The evening prayer. Almighty God, as we enter upon our periods of operation and liberty in the Mediterranean, grant to each one of us a high resolve to do whatever tasks are assigned us to the very best of our ability, to live with our fellow men in the highest degree of friendship, to keep ourselves pure in thought, in word, and in deed, and at all times to keep open to thee the avenues of approach and communication. Amen. First stop for pilots is the ready room. On the hangar deck, maintenance crews check out planes and prepare for the launch. On the flight deck, planes are fueled, armed, and spotted. Gentlemen, we've got a max effort this time. We've got 11 aircraft on the deck and we'll launch two divisions and an additional section. I'll take the lead division, Mr. Maddox will take the second division, Mr. Drain, the third section. Mr. O'Leary will stand by. You have your aircraft assignments on the board. I want you to get off here smartly, make a good clearing turn off the bow when you're catted, and proceed to the rendezvous area eight miles on the starboard beam. Pilots, man your planes. Let's go, Tiger. up to catapult position. The Angel takes station for rescue work. Firefighters in asbestos suits stand by during takeoffs and landing. The flight surgeon and two hospital corpsmen are also on hand. The catapult men worked within inches of searing hot jet exhaust. Precise timing and superb teamwork keep accidents low and efficiency high. Within a few minutes, all the jets are launched. Prop planes follow. Both flights are on their way to support a combined British, Italian, US amphibious landing exercise. Now to get the flight deck ready to take them back aboard. It pays to advertise, even on a carrier at sea. While the carrier prepares to recover more aircraft, some of the fleet's destroyers are conducting anti-aircraft firing and anti-submarine exercises. Someplace overhead, a plane tows a sleeve at high speed. Radar pinpoints the target for the guns.
then there are submarines attached to the six fleet much of the time they operate independently of the other ships carrying out their own special training exercises but from time to time they simulate an attacking force of enemy subs a worldwide count of over eight hundred submarines with over two thirds of them potentially hostile indicates that should a major war occur subsurface warfare will be waged on a gigantic scale a submerged submarine equipped with the most modern electronic tracking equipment, tries to penetrate the destroyer screen and strike at the heavy ships. The destroyers try to pick him up on sonar and track him. Once they have him, some ships are detached to form a hunter-killer group. High speed and exceptional maneuverability puts the group in position to drive home its attack. To the south of the carrier group, Italian, British, and U.S. ships carry out a combined amphibious landing exercise. U.S. Marines, part of the reinforced battalion, continuously embarked in six fleet ships, and British Royal Commandos swarm ashore to capture and hold the beachhead. After the exercise, British, Italian, and U.S. commanders meet aboard the Salem flagship of the Sixth Fleet to evaluate the exercise. Within a few weeks, some of these same commanders will witness the newest Marine Corps developments in amphibious techniques. At other distant points in the Mediterranean, push-button warfare gets a workout. This cruiser launches Regulus, a long-range, surface-to-surface guided missile that can carry an atomic warhead hundreds of miles. Carriers and submarines can also launch regulars. Controllable, accurate and potent, Regulus is the predecessor of long-range fleet ballistic missiles now under development. In another area of the Mediterranean is an anti-aircraft guided missile cruiser. It launches surface-to-air guided missiles. The range and accuracy of these missiles have been tested many times. Early the next morning, another carrier joins the task group. Seldom do heavy ships of the Sixth Fleet operate in World War II type task groups. The ever-present danger of atomic attack precludes the bullseye formation of bygone days. Today, the big ships join up for brief periods and then separate, always presenting to potential enemies an elusive mobile target whose exact location cannot be predicted in advance by ballistic missile computers. Not far over the horizon is the cruiser Salem. Where the Salem will be at any particular time is often a big question, even to ships in the fleet, the Salem operates independently, covering the many different widely dispersed units as circumstances require. As is his custom, the commander of the Sixth Fleet frequently makes informal calls on ships at sea. Whirlybirds are the aerial taxis of the fleet. Probably no admiral ever had more colorful sideboards. Mobility of the fleet depends upon the tankers which rendezvous with the ships every few days. While the ship's bands give out with the rhythm, Hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel oil, jet fuel, and aviation gas flow through suspended hoses. Along with the oil, some of the fleet's many visitors are transferred to the carrier by High Line. This is the modern version of the daring young man on the flying trapeze. A steady stomach is required equipment. 
They haven't dunked a man in months. Rural mail carrier to the fleet is the COD, carrier on board delivery plane from the mail distribution center in Naples. The average delivery is about 2,000 pounds and the plane makes six landings a week. Average time for a letter from the States to reach the ship is seven days. Sometimes all the mail received goes to other ships. Mail call, mail call. All division mail POs lay down to the post office and pick up your divisional mail. But mail call, the sweetest music this side of heaven, means that some of this load was for the carrier. Today is Sunday, and church services are held as exercise schedules permit. Small ships, however, have no chaplains. Appropriately enough, the angel lends a helping hand. Destroyers have no open deck space where helicopters can land, but rescue helicopters have a hatch and a windlass. FOB destroyer, one sky pilot to take care of the spiritual needs of men engaged in hazardous occupations thousands of miles from home. In addition to everything else during the day, planes have been launched and recovered continuously. Tonight, and for the next six nights, night carrier operations are scheduled. goes as planned, these chicks will return to the bird farm about 22.30. Along a deserted section of the coast of Sardinia the following morning, the carrier Franklin D. Roosevelt, newly arrived from the States, rendezvous with the task unit. In company, the two ships head for open water and scheduled air operations. The Roosevelt carries Navy supersonic fighters. Navy supersonic heavy attack aircraft are also carried by the Roosevelt. Steam catapult provide the extra push needed to get the big birds airborne. Today the op schedule calls for practice runs with sidewinders. Deadly accurate heat-seeking guided missiles. Randolph pilots will make practice runs on each other. No missiles will actually be released. Rough seas begin to plague the carriers. The destroyer boys should be getting submarine pay. Primary flight control center is concerned as planes low on fuel try for a quick landing. The first plane comes in high and cautious and the stern of the carrier drops out from under. fuel is almost gone. He either makes it this time or ditches. Flag plane. There will be a meeting in the ward room for all division officers upon securing from flight quarters. In the crew's quarters, there's been a sudden revival of interest in dress uniforms, haircuts, and well-shined shoes. Other ships of the fleet are experiencing a similar awakening of interest. Well-read whodunits are being replaced with more important books. How do you say, hello, beautiful, in Italian? 